Can you hear me? Hello, welcome to another week of The Pop-Up. This is The Pop-Up with Black College Experience. We have another great week this Thursday night as NFL is back, but we're going to start off with what we call The Pop-Up of the Week, and that's from The Black College Experience. We have a really special guest tonight that we're going to take it over to another conference. We hear about the SWAC, we hear about the MEAC, but we're taking it out of these conferences. We're going to get into another school that we don't talk about so often. We do have a wonderful guest tonight. And of course, I got my wonderful co-host over in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. But before we hop into our guest, Derek, where you at? I'm excited because you did mention the NFL is coming back. But (laughs) you know, my team are the reigning, defending Super Bowl champions. The Kansas City Chiefs take the field tonight against those Houston Texans. So I'm glad to see I, that I, my squad. I, I bet it on the Chiefs tonight. I, I bet it on the Chiefs tonight, Eric. I, I did. You're going to win some money. I went with the Chiefs tonight. I did. So, yeah, I just, you know, ready for the weekend, this short week. Ready for the weekend. So, tell us what guests we have on tonight, and we won't prolong it so we can get into this right. great interview. Well, I, I saw this guy. Uh, page uh, on my mentors page. We were mutual friends with uh, Tyrone Mm Keys, who's my mentor. So when I clicked on his page, I was like, okay, you know, he he went to an HBCU and then I started to read up about him. And I'm like, okay, he played in Super Bowl three with Joe Namath. So when I hit him up, he was so gracious to respond. And he's an HBCU legend that probably no one in our generation knows about unless you follow Metal Eastern Shore. I, I know I didn't know who he was, but I was wild. I'm a history buff. So we have tonight on with us Earl the Twirl. <laughs> How you doing, Mr. Earl? I'm doing marvelous, man. I tell you, it was a joy and a pleasure to be on with Keisha and yourself, buddy. I'm telling you, you guys are awesome. <laughs> yes, indeed. Wait, okay, before we start, come on, you got to tell me where the twirl, that was one of my first questions, the twirl. Come on, where it come from? Where did it come uh, from? see, I thought you would never answer, <laughs> ask that. Well, I got it. Chris Berman from ESPN gave that to me. He gave me that title, Earl the Twirl. He said, uh, when I run the football, I'll be twirling and twirling and trying to get away. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, I'm yeah, stuck with that name. And I like that. And then it rhymes with your name, too, Earl of Twirl. You know, because you know, we had Earl of Pearl, but I like Twirl better. Okay, that's right. I know Earl of Pearl, too. <laughs> he went to <laughs> Winston-Salem State. There you go. <laughs> yeah. All right, Keisha, you want me to lead it off? You want to lead it off? Okay, so we we'll, we'll start off. Uh, it don't matter if you want me to. It don't matter if you. you want I'll be that's mine. ladies first. Oh, man. <laughs> well, thank you so kindly. So, of course, you know, unless you, most people in our generations, and I, I have to say, because Derek is 40 already, so I'm just a couple months behind. So, we're the 80s babies. <laughs> so, we would be like a 1980. So, I guess more of our generation would know unless they actually follow. What made you choose? the HBCU that you chose, uh, University of Eastern Maryland Shore, which, uh, correct me, it wasn't, was it Maryland College then? No, uh, Maryland State, Maryland State, that's Maryland, what State. Said, Maryland State College, but the, the okay. beautiful, yeah, I'm from Maryland, so that, that's one of the reasons, but the most important reason was I had two cousins that attended uh, Maryland State, University of Maryland Eastern Shore, uh, uh, Bernard Christie Jr. and Stanley Christie, and uh, 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 so in fact, uh, Stanley became a principal athlete, graduated from Maryland State. But uh, I just loved the atmosphere. I had a chance to go down and visit. I mean, it's way out there in Maryland on the Eastern Shore. So uh, probably that was the first time I ever been on the Eastern Shore. So uh, yeah, my cousins uh, went there and. I thought it was just a great fit for me. Yeah, and I, I know this, it's one of those, I think, I, like I said, really, 
I would have to actually dig to even get like some of the information. And it, it is. It's just like Derek said, he's a history book. So it's kind of like I'm the same way I kind of go through and I start looking and digging and I start seeing things. So take us back to some of your school days when you play or tell us about some of the memories in your play days when you were playing uh, for Eastern Maryland Shore. Okay. Well, you know what's so u- unique about my host journey? I never played organized football, tackle football, until I went to college. Because unfortunately, I was denied the opportunity to go to a school that had football. And then plus, uh, they didn't give us the opportunity to have football in our school. So uh, the first time I ever had contact, it was go to Merlin Eastern Shore. And I had a roommate that was on the football team. And, you know, my first year, I didn't try out because, you know, I was trying to get my studies together and all, all those type of things. And during the fall of the year, they had what we call a, a tryout time for people to think they can play football or, or try to make the team. And my roommate was teasing me and he was saying, hey, Earl, man, well, you know, you got great speed, you got good hands, and maybe you should try out for the football team. And so one day I went over to the locker room and uh, Skip McCain was the Hall of Fame coach uh, that he was. Uh, he said, uh, what are you doing over here? And first he said, what do you do? You, did, did you lose your key or left your key or somewhere? I said, no. I said, you told me I could play football. He said, oh, I was just joking with you. I know you're a good athlete, but I was joking. But anyhow, I said, now you tell me. So anyhow, I went and got my equipment and started to put it on and and all that. I couldn't even put on the equipment. I needed help with the equipment. And I saw these guys over uh, by the locker, and they were laughing because they always love new guys that are coming out. So just real quick, I'll just tell you a story. So I got my uniform on. I went out on the field and I'm watching the practice and the coach Skip McCain said now just watch the play I didn't know anything about going through the left hole or the one or the two and all those things so anyhow the, the quarterback said sing the hut one hut two and gave the ball to a running back he said watch now and he hit that running back and knocked him down and they said roll him off the field I said I'm in trouble now because back in the day we didn't have no cell phone I couldn't even call home so now I can't turn around and, and just Kind of like say chicken out, and then the same thing happened to another player. And then here come my big opportunity. And, and the coach told me, "You go off the left tackle." I had to learn what a tackle was, offensive tackle, defense, and all that. So he went over the plays with me, and he said, "You go off his left hook." And they call the play signal, set down, hut one, hut two. Gave the ball to me, and I was running over people. And guess what? I forgot to open my eyes. If, and the coach said, if you didn't close your eyes, you could have, could have stored, scored. So that was the first touch of me playing football in college, <laughs> organized football for the first time. Right. And, and I, did, I you, we, you could hear the excitement in his voice, Derek. He took us back to like that actual first moment. I oh. can hear the excitement in your voice like you was really, and I'm laughing because you said you didn't know how to put on the equipment. So I can hear the excitement. <laughs> <laughs> in your voice that you done went over there to try it out but don't know how to get through with that. Listen, that's 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 funny. Um go ahead, dear. Well, you know, it's funny. I mean, my first time ever playing organized football, uh I was in the eighth grade. And I didn't know how to put on the equipment either. Did you know like, how to put on yourself? <laughs> like, you know how to put on yourself either? This go with I, hey, I had never used it before. I mean I I knew how to do it. Oh, you were in eighth grade, okay. You know, I was yeah, in okay. eighth grade. So, like, to go back to the high school, like you said, your high school didn't uh, have football. Well, let's talk about some of the sports you played in high school and, right. and, and, some, and some of your uh, laurels in high school for the sports that you played in high school. Well, let me start off with first with uh, track and field. And from my seventh grade all the way up to my senior year, I was on the track team and we we won the state championship, so that was great. We had a great coach, uh, a great PE teacher, uh, and uh, so. And then I went and ran cross country. That's like two mile run, and I, I always did that to try to get in shape for what I was known to play is basketball. So I ran cross country, but my love was basketball. I had the opportunity to play basketball in school, and and you never forget some of the good rewards or awards that you won 
And in one game, I scored 42 points. The other team had only, uh, I mean, 43. The other team had 42. And I missed six minutes of the third quarter. And and uh, my cousin, Bernard Christie Jr., said, put him back in the game so he could break the record because he took me out of the game in the third quarter. And, and I only had 25 points at that time. So he put me back in the game. And I broke the record, 43 points, and the other team had 42. I remember that in high school, and I played basketball. <laughs> right. And, and and the thing is, like you said, you weren't allowed to go to Aberdeen High School right. due to segregation. So talk about, you know, uh, how, how that affected you and, you know, not being able to, you know, you know, f- f- just that, because me and Keisha, we, we don't know anything about that, but you know, you yeah. went through that. Yeah. See, a lot of people don't know really what I had to go through. I, I'll just back up a little bit. Uh, I, I remember I loved cheeseburgers, of course, growing up. I, I oh. lived on a farm and all that good stuff. And and uh, so I, I wanted a cheeseburger and I had to go in the back of the restaurant to get a cheeseburger. I mean, right there, that was tough. And then if I wanted to go to the movies, I couldn't go downstairs I had to go upstairs and then and it was tough on me but I'm so grateful that I had a grandmother who raised me from a kid you know my mother's only was 16 years older than me and brought me home the beautiful part about that she taught me about love she taught me about uh, respecting people and understanding uh, those certain situations I mean because I went through a lot of stuff and uh, even when in college and uh uh, demonstrating and stuff like that, but we had a love and a foundation for the Lord, and that was one of the most important things. And I know, and today, that is the key factor that's going to turn us around from segregation or discrimination is because we need to love one another, and and it starts with us, the people. That's what it's all about. In any field of work, there's people that maybe not doing the right thing, but I know love. Trumps everything, as they say. It takes everything. You can love one another, and that's what it's all about. So when I went to the school, uh, and and just imagine, every morning I'm driving, going to school, I drive past that school who had football, and I couldn't have the opportunity to do it. And back in the day, I loved the Baltimore coach, uh, Lenny Moore, and even John Unitas, which I ended up playing against in the Super Bowl. And uh, I and I, I loved uh, Big Daddy Lips and all those people before. I mean, and not having the opportunity to play that game, I mean, it was just uh, uh, devastating to me. But I always say, it's not where you start, it's where you finish. So I didn't let that deter me. I didn't let that stop me. I didn't let that bitter me because my grandmother always said, you got to forgive people and it starts within yourself. But uh, it, it, it was a little uh, a tough to understand that and you know and you had to explain to me why the reason because the color of my skin but uh that we had to do that but and you know it's it's just amazing when i, I think about the things that we had to go through and uh, uh, as we will talk later on in the book that i went through that but i'm not bitter about it because if you sometimes people don't know and don't understand it's all about education and we always say when the people uh, don't get educated uh, they are will perish, and that's what it's all about. But it, it, it's all about loving and respecting one another. But uh, I didn't let that stop me. You know what I'm saying? Because you know we always say we just keep trying harder and harder each and every day, and keep persevering. Exactly, exactly. So you know, th- now we're gonna move fast forward back up to college. You're at Maryland Eastern Shore. You got family there, and you just told us about your introduction. Talk about your emergence as a football star uh, for the Hawks. Well, I, I tell you, what what amazing uh, play with some great players. In fact, before I, you know, when I graduated, about 14 or 15, went into the NFL. And I'll tell you about the Super Bowl when we get to that point. But the bottom line, we had great teachers and great mentors. The coaches had to teach a class. So I majored in physical education. My high school coach inspired me, the way he handled people, the way he taught uh, and coached PE, how he treated people. This is what I wanted to do after a while, you know, to go to college. And, and the beautiful part, 
But when, like you said, after that practice and everything on the field, learning the plays, being able to catch the football and the work ethic, you know, and I, I remember the coach used to always say, can you go when you're taught? You know, one say, have you ever given up your all or, or give you that second and third effort in anything that you do? So we related to two sports. So on the field, and this is really a, a good true story. We were on the goal line and we had a drill and the the coach would blow the whistle and then you would hit the ground when you keep running till you get to the end of the field. And I was like 10 yards in front of the other people. And they said, Christy, slow down, slow down. God had blessed me with good speed. I didn't know any better. I wanted to give it every time and all my effort, 100% when I went down the field. And and, and that was in practice. And, and, and even in the practice, I would go hard and try to hit people and run over people. And they said, wait a minute, say some of this for the game and everything. But I, I just was just blessed for the opportunity to do that and work with some good folks. And, and my roommate was the third string quarterback. So when I got a chance to get in the game, he would give me the football all the time. <laughs> it was amazing. But we probably had the game won by then, okay, until I, each and every day or every year I improved as a player and became one of the better players on the team and lead and receive and all that. <laughs> Can you hear me? So, yeah. So talk about some of the rivals that you play. Because me and King said, Keisha was saying that, you know, we're swag, we're swag babies. So oh, talk excuse to me, about- Mr. Swag. <laughs> talk okay. to us about that was the a great rivalry. <laughs> the rivalry well, that you well I have you to know, we're going to talk about the CIAA and the MEAC, okay? And, boy, when you think about that, I think about Morgan State. Morgan State. I'll tell you, in Baltimore, Maryland, man, what a great coach. In fact, they had the former coach that used to be at Maryland State under Skip McCain, uh, Earl Banks. What a great person, great man, and just a student of the game. And that's what was so awesome, going against Morgan State. And, of course, you know, you had some homeboys. In fact, later on down the road, my, my daughter went to Morgan State, and I had a lot of friends that went to Morgan State. Yeah, oh, man, we used to. We used to get after each other. I, I tell you, it was something, and especially when we went up to Baltimore. You know, I'm telling you, standing room only out there. But that was some great rivals going against the Willie Lanier's and uh, uh, Raymond Chester. I mean, they had so many great players back then, man. I tell you, in in those divisions and those leagues were really competitive, man. We, we were blessed. A lot of great athletes. Right, and back then, you know, the NFL definitely recognized HBCU talent because uh, players like you and Willie Lanier, who starred from my Kansas City Chiefs, were oh, drafted excuse me. in the NFL. <laughs> hey, Willie Lanier, and you heard it from me, is the best linebacker that ever played the game. And they said, well, come on now, I'm not just saying because you love the Kansas City Chiefs because we didn't like them when we played, okay? They were arch rivals, big time in the pros. But Willie Lanier could play pass defense, and he would tackle you. I mean, he was called him. He was he was mean. They had to take him out of practice. That's how hard he used to hit. And they had to make a special helmet for him, as you know, <laughs> being a Kansas City Chief follower. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Keisha? <laughs> yeah, a commercial break before we and I will come back to uh, to hop into the draft uh, before when he went to play pro. But we'll have to take this commercial break. All right, go ahead, Keisha. All right, today's uh, Black College Experience co- commercial break is brought to you by HBCU Now. HBCU Now is a company that assists parents, students, teachers, guidance counselors, and guardians with information on HBCUs based on their prospective major. HBCU Now is owned by Southern University graduate Sylvia Provost, which helps uh, assist 9th through 12th graders, but also assist others with HBCU knowledge. She says that once this virus is over, she will be taking it to the streets and moving on the road to speak to others and educate them about uh, HBCUs and her company, HBCU Now. For more information, please email her at hbcunow one at gmail.com. All 
Oh, that's awesome. I mean, you know, I'm definitely going to check that out and I'm definitely going to share that. And um, I actually saw you post something about that. And, you know, when you have a black owned business like that, where, you know, we're talking about, um, you know, recruiting for HBCUs and exposure to HBCUs, we definitely need a Keisha. I can understand why, um, you know, you're, we're partnering with them because that's your mission. You know, so you, you you two ladies' mission kind of kind of uh blend in, bleed in together, and both of you are Southern Lady Jaguars. Correct. <laughs> so if we if we catch them before they get to high, if, if we catch them in high school, then we know that they're going to be coming to HBCUs after that. So we do. We try to catch them before that. You know, they they go to other schools, and again, we always say we're not knocking other schools, but. You know, if we can get them to come to our institutions, you know, it, it's just better for us all the way around. I'd like to add to that. Team. I definitely agree. Go ahead, Kills. Yeah. Okay. So you know, now that we're. I, I... Go, ahead. Go ahead. No, oh, I was I... about to just hop it. To, I, I was about to hop into the draft because now that we've gone through your college years, I was about to hop into what the draft process was like for you coming out of an HBCU. Um, what was that like for you back then? Like, what was that like, the draft process for you coming out of Eastern Maryland well, Shore? Well, you know, a lot of times we didn't get as much exposure that we needed, okay? And back in the day, they had 20 rounds. Can you believe 20 rounds? And uh, uh, unfortunately, back in the day, and, 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 you know, thank God for the Wall of Paytons and the Jerry Rice's as they come along because of the exposure. But uh, we, we uh, uh, Emerson Boozer, I'll give an example, was drafted number three, should have been a, a drafted number one. There's no question about one of the best players they ever played uh, in, in the league. And, and we were so glad that later on with Wall of Paytons and the Jerry Rice and what have you came along. It's just the exposure, the publicity, but the smart scouts would come down to the small colleges, you know, the HBA, the colleges, and, and just uh, share uh, their thing because they found out a lot of talent because uh, some places we couldn't go to certain schools, you know, and uh, even on our team, there were some players that never played uh, 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 with an uh, African American or black player and everything, and that's what made our team so special. With, with Joe Namath being the person that he was, he's from Pennsylvania, but he played for Alabama. But uh, the guys worked together in peace and harmony, and we loved each other. You know what I'm saying? And uh, that's that was so amazing about us uh, working together. But yeah, the draft they would they would come down. Uh, and, and uh, talk to us, you know, and basically they hope that some of the players didn't go before that hand, but they would come down to see a couple games. And like, uh, I just remember they came down to see Emerson Boozer and guess what happens? They saw Earl Christie, this guy running touchdowns and punt returns and all of that. And, and had me to sign up as a free agent and, People don't know what a free agent, that means you don't get drafted. Uh, you get an opportunity to be invited to camp and go for it. But uh, we had we had some players, like you say, in the small colleges that, you know, that uh, we didn't have the opportunity to go up in the high draft. But then guess what? Once they got there, the people like the Johnny Samples and the Roger Browns and, and what have you, and the Sherman Plunkett that, that, that went to our school. I mean, they came right away and made a, an uh, instant impact. And most of them, you know, two tall Jones or all of the great players that we could just go on and on, you know, the Star Wars. But but later on, they start getting the publicity and they understand a lot of talent was there. And the, and the bottom line that I loved about our, co our coaches made sure we got out of education. And that's so important. Off the field is good as on the field, things that uh, happen. And that's what we got. We got a great education. And that's why I was going to uh, uh, interrupt you about it's, it's great to go undergrad to a historic Blacks college. It's no question about it. And the experience is phenomenal. And the education is second to none. And then I always would encourage, because I'm a former school teacher, and then you can go to another university you know, for grad school. But having that unique experience is nothing like it. I mean, it's extra special. The camaraderie, the relationship, 
And you found out that a, a lot of the young people that went to these schools had a great, strong foundation of loving and caring. And that is so important. And you answered my next question because my next question was going to be the importance of attending HBCUs. And, we, and, you know, we look at this climate right now and so many things are, are going on. And we look at the shift as, as to how many four-star and five-star um, athletes are now choosing HBCUs. And so we look at the importance of, you know, behind it. And like you said, it's the education, not just even the athletic part, but the, the educational part, the component that comes with it. So now, tell us, what was it like playing with Joe Namath? I met uh-huh. Joe Namath in 2019 at the Black College Football Hall of Fame enshrinement here in Atlanta. So I did get a chance to meet him and then take a picture with him. And, of course, as I would say, haters would think, the water ain't wet till they drown. And so that, people were actually saying I photoshopped myself. In the <laughs> I'm, I'm going to tell them. Of course, it's not true. But, you know. Well, he is truly a great human being. And, and, and we used to tease him, call him Blue Eyes Soul Brother, okay? But he was an <laughs> awesome person, really. I'm serious. And that's one of the things that helped us in our, our college, working with people. Uh, you know, our linebacker was from Mississippi, Larry Grantham, and uh, uh, Verlin Biggs from Jackson State, okay? And and they, they never – Play uh, uh, with uh, a, a, a a black and white person, you know, for the first time ever. And man, I'm telling you, we loved one another, and it was amazing. And Joe Namath was one of the key persons. Man, there's no question about it. And a lot of people, he doesn't get credit. He should have made the Hall of Fame. How he brought people from the South, Southwest, and all that together as one group. Because he's colorblind, there's no question about it. And uh, I, I, I'm so grateful today that we're still friends. And he, in fact, he's one of the ones that uh, wrote a, a uh, you know, uh, introduction in my uh, uh, book. But no, no question about it. And that's what it's all about, relationships, working together. That's why sports is so awesome. And you know that the Olympics and all those things, it is amazing how it can bring people together. That's the one of the greatest things about sports, okay? All right. So now, what was it like? playing with other HBCU players at that time. Oh, babe, I'm telling you, you're talking about a fun, you know, I, I know you hear like people say talk, uh, 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 trash talking. No, it's still talking trash. You see, they didn't change it around a little bit. Trash talking, that's at all. It's talking trash. Well, we used to talk trash, man. Uh, and, and I'm telling you, I mean, and in a good way, you know what I mean? We got to get after each other, man. I mean, so competitive. And that's what was so awesome, man. You know, we, we went hard, man. You know what I'm saying? If somebody else had to go 20 or 30 yards, we went 40 yards. We know I had to be better than the next person. That's the attitude that we had. Because I always believe my attitude will take me to my altitude. It'll take us as far as we want to go in life. And that's the key fact in anything that we do. And, and boy, it was fun going against each other. I mean, I mean you talking about talking trash. We talked a lot of trash and had fun. And a lot of them backed it up, too. <laughs> well, well, repeat that quote you just said. Your, your attitude will determine your ad- altitude. Yeah, your I, your attitude will take you to your altitude. It will take you to your altitude. You want to go? There's no sky oh, wow. limit. There's no question. And you know, you as an old saying goes, you gotta reach within yourself and have you ever given it your all. And that's the key. The mind can be the most powerful, yet it can be the weakest. But if you really think positive. Because, see, you have a choice. That's the beautiful part about all of this. Making choices and decisions in life. There's no different. What I get on the football field, I take into life now. That's what it's all about. Your attitude will take you to your altitude. It will take you as high as you want to go. There's no limit on that. See, we put a limit on things. You know what? You know what? I mean, just... I mean, you, you, you're preaching to us now, Pastor Earl. You know what I'm saying? 
You I'm know, just I'm, feeling it. I'm, I'm going to be real, buddy. There's no question, man. I, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I'm just proud of my young people and having the opportunity to share and let them know that we can work together in peace and harmony and we can be the team. Actually, all the family now, you talk about preaching, we can all come from the same place. So I want to go there, but I'm talking about a team. All of us on the same team. All we want is love and affection. But see, we go in the wrong places to get that. And it starts with yourself. If you don't love yourself and like yourself, you can't love others. You can't like others. Look in the mirror, as Michael Jackson said. We got to look ourselves in the mirror and try to be the best that we can be. That's what I was taught. And that's what I live each and every day. There's no question about it. Yes, indeed. Now, you know, since we're on, we're on your time with the Jets, um, let's talk about, first off, before I ask you that question, uh, in, in that Super Bowl, uh, there were five Man Eastern Shore Hawks. Let's talk yes. about those guys because I'm going to have to do some homework. I think that is the most HBCU players that's played in a single Super Bowl, I think. I'm going to have to – Well, no, you don't have to think it. It's it's history. You're absolutely right. <laughs> You're absolutely right, Derek. Uh, uh, James Duncan – Played defensive back. He was on the Colts. And Charlie Stooks, who played defensive back and quarterback. Those were our two quarterbacks. Now, me and Emerson Boozer used to beat them up in practice every day. So what made them think that they're going to go in the Super Bowl and gonna still going to beat us, okay? I mean, that was right. the attitude we had. And Johnny Sample. Johnny Sample was before us. So we had two that was on the Colts. And three on the New York Jets. Right. Johnny Sample, Emerson Booz, and myself. No question about it. And and I gotta tell you a story that most people don't know. You know, the, the guys okay. together, we were right near the the uh, uh getting ready for the Super Bowl. We we're in Fort Lauderdale and, and the hotels weren't too far apart and all that. And so some of the guys from Jackson State, Willie Richardson, Berlin Biggs, you know, we got together and and, and they played cards, right? And somebody during the card game said, and it wasn't us, it was the Colts. He said, just in case we don't win, uh, I, I win this card game and we win on Sunday, just in case. They, and boy, you could hear a pin drop because they were saying they knew they were going to beat us. But see, they forgot one thing. And I got, this is a true story. My grandmother, your name is guaranteed on Thursday, but my grandmother said it on a Monday, and she was a praying woman. She said, we're going to win. She didn't know that much about football, but she said, we're going to win. But, uh, yeah, we had five guys, more than any college in America, okay? We're now, very proud now, of that. Now, now we're on that Super Bowl, and, and, you know, let's talk about that guarantee, because, you know, you know, whenever a sports figure guarantees that they're going to win, uh, you are, it always go back to Joe Namath's guarantee in the Super Bowl, you exactly. know. So I think, you know, as for our generation, for our for our age group, I think that's the first person that we can remember guaranteeing uh, a win at that grand upper stage. So, but still, even now, when someone says we're going to win, you always bring up Joe Namath. So you know, Keisha got a chance to meet Joe Namath in person. You know, she got a chance to uh, be right. a part of that ceremony and be around him. So, now I want you to tell us about that guarantee and how did the team feel or uh, was Mr. Namath, uh, was he superior as far as confidence or was he nervous that he said, well, I hope I can, you know, hold up my end of this bargain that I put my team in? Boy, what a great question, buddy. Okay, let me break it down before he made the guarantee. We were, we were uh, looking at that film, and our tight end, Pete Lambert, said, we, we better stop, we view Frank, our coach, we better stop looking at the film before we get overconfident. Okay, first of all, Joe called 90% of the plays from the line of scrimmage. That means the coach had to be in the wrong defense. Okay, now, when we were talking in practice and everything, so Joe is at a – a sports banquet and receiving awards. And it was on a Thursday right before the Sunday Super Bowl. And this guy was in the back room hackling, saying, y'all going to get killed? You won't even get past the 50-yard line. 
I could run a kickoff past the 50 yard line, you know what I'm saying? And y'all gonna do that. And Joe just jumped up and said, I'm tired of this. We're gonna win. And I guarantee you, that's what made him say the guarantee. And then we view bank, the coach said, Joe, why did you tell the coach that we're gonna win? He said, Didn't you say we're gonna win? I was just repeating what you were saying, coach. He said, but you shouldn't have gave me any food. Well, I was just telling the truth. We win. And I guarantee it. And like I said earlier, my grandmother said on Monday, they told me this, okay? They were watching football. They didn't know nothing about the game, but they knew my number was 45, okay? <laughs> to catch the opening kickoff of Super Bowl three. <laughs> but, uh, oh, yeah, no. It, that definitely, yeah, he, he definitely got confidence to all of us here. Did you tell Joe about your grandmother's prediction? Oh, yes, I had to tell him. In fact, I tell him when I go out and speak all over the United States. Yeah, he man. Now, he said guarantee. But see, guess what? See, my grandmother was a praying woman, so I figured that's a guarantee. She didn't have to say it, okay? And she said it first on Monday, but that's okay. We'll, we'll give it to Joe, okay? Uh, and, and, and fact, yes, Pete Lambert fact. Pete Lambert said it before Joe in a meeting. You know, when he said, we better stop looking at the film before we get overconfident. Yes, yeah. indeed. So uh, now we want to take it to uh, after your football career. So after you retired, you played three years for the Jets. Uh, did you try to play for any other teams? No, no. Unfortunately, I had death in my family. It's amazing how timing can go. And uh, we lost someone in our family. And and then, you know, I'm with the kids and, and, and my wife going down to uh, her mother's or grandmother and whatever. And so, and it just happened. I, I, I got to thank Don Shuler. I was going to probably try out for the top, uh, uh, Miami Dolphin, but no, I, I, I didn't um, go for any other team. And now I'm really kind of glad today because we know how physical this game is. And I, I have been pretty much blessed, you know, with broken jaw, shoulder separation, but a lot of guys and my teammates have dementia and all those things. And it, it really uh, did, did a job on you. And, you know, football is a, a rough sport. So, but I, I, I was blessed, but I didn't uh, go for another team. At that time, I wanted to go, but right. I was sure that I switched over to another one called or professional show basketball with the Hall Wizards, which was a lot of fun, and nobody had to hit me. <laughs> I was well, having fun. At it. You said yeah. professional show basketball? Yeah, the Hall Wizards. See, you oh. haven't read the book yet. Well, yeah, I, I just got it today. Uh, okay, well, that's why I'm saying I'm forgiven, man. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I played professional show basketball, and that was fun. Traveling all over the world, traveling in the schools, the college. You know, I, I, I used to shoot the ball on my knees at half court, even sometimes kick it in. Did y'all ever play the club, Travis? <laughs> yeah. Man, they weren't ready for us. That's why my <laughs> son did a TV special with the Globe Trotters. See, they had to take him, and he did the halftime show for the Harlem Wizard. See, it's in the book. <laughs> I would definitely read it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, okay. no, uh, no, they, and the Harlem Globe Trotters, no, the special. You know, they were special. Curly Neal, Metal Lock, all of them. Uh, Marcus Ain. I, I love these guys. What what they've done for the world as in tour ambassadors. And no okay. question. So about let's, it. And that's let's what it's talk, all about. So let's talk about your transition uh, to the classroom. You were a teacher and a PE teacher. And uh, did you ever want? Did you coach during your time as a PE teacher? Of course I coach. Yeah. No, I'm loving. It. Yeah. Oh, I, I coach the girls basketball. I coach the, the boys basketball. I mean, whatever, you know, because those were the base basic sports, you know, you know, that I coach. I, I, I coach minor league football. In fact, we won a couple. They call the minor league Super Bowl champion, you know, and everything. And, and one of the proudest moments was coaching with my friend Billy Joe, who coached at Cheney State. And uh, I was assistant coach there. So I had a chance to coach college and, and you know, and coach many different places. The Joe Namus football camp, you name it. So, yeah. Uh, yeah we, in fact, we had the camp up until 46 years, a couple years ago, a uh, Joe Namus camp. So, oh, yeah. That's and awesome. I still work with the uh, young people now. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. All right. Keisha? Oh, I forgot. I coached over in Africa 
Ah, yes. We went over in Africa, and of course, in the book, it will tell you about that. I was very blessed to be a chief, not no honorary, but a chief uh, uh, in um, Ghana and West Africa. And it was so amazing, just real quick, is that, we, you know, they love uh, soccer and they, and they love uh, ri- uh, rugby. So the hardest part was with them, with the football, they'd be running like the football, and then they would land it back. I said, no, this is not rugby. This is American football. And that was one of the toughest things that they had to get used to. But they were tough, though. Good gracious. A lot of them weren't big, but they were tough and coachable. That's what's so important. Yes, and Keisha? Take this commercial once again. Today's Black College Experience commercial break is brought to you by HBCU Now. HBCU Now is a company that assists parents, students, teachers, guidance counselors, and guardians with information on HBCUs based on prospective majors. HBCU Now is owned by Southern University graduate Sylvia Provost, in which she helps ninth through 12th graders and assists them with HBCU knowledge and attending HBCUs. Once this virus is over, Ms. Provost has said she's taking it to the road to speak and educate others on her company, HBCU Now. You can email her for more information at hbcunow1 at gmail.com. Mr. Christie, so tell us this. Now, Life After, I know you, you talk about the book, and I'll have to talk about it. How did you get into sports media? Mr. Christie, God, I unmute yourself. Okay, hey, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay, yeah, that, that, that's another uh, great question, Keisha. Uh, what was so amazing, uh, after I left the New York Jets, uh, I went into uh, entrepreneurial different things. I, I owned my own clothing store and my own record store in my hometown, Hartford County, in Havre Grace, Maryland at that time. And uh, I, I remember that um, the Colts, had, they had a radio station there, and uh, uh, some people was talking and say, "Hey, Earl, uh, uh, would you like to do the pregame coat shows on radio?" Now I'm, I'm, I was scared to get him from the classroom. So can you imagine at that time? And I learned after I played for the Jets, that really got me out of it, especially when they used to go and speak, what have you. But anyhow, uh, I said, "Yeah, I'll, I'll try." So we had a local radio station that did the uh, pregame coat show. So I got on with a friend of mine, Frankie something, and uh, and we we would we would predict the scores, talk about the players, and then from that day, bam, next TV, I, you know, never done the TV, so I started that in Maryland at, at a, a what we call a nonprofit station, you know, cable, and then from there I went on to Wilmington, Delaware, and that's when I started my show. 1971, basically during that same time, uh, Earl Christie Sports Show. And uh, actually it was on a channel that just showed weather. And, and I had the wealth on, and God bless me with that, to start a commercial television station in Wilmington, Delaware. And I had the first show on there and it was a sports show. And after that, other shows came on, spiritual shows and coaches shows and what have you. But uh, yeah, that's how I got into it. I mean, it was just a, a blessing that I got in, and I knew a little bit about sports, and I, you know, and I, I taught, you know, PE teaching, all that good stuff. So, uh, yeah, I kind of like fell into it, and I've been ever since happy because I covered one of the only two reporters that ever covered Dr. J and Michael Jordan in their prime. So I've been doing it since 1971. Wow! Wow! And- that's good. What was that? What was that like covering them when you say in their prime? What was that like? Because I mean, that had to be major. Okay, well, I'm gonna start with the Sixers because that, like I said, I lived in Wilmington, Delaware, and uh, and what was so amazing, Philly's 30 miles away, so I covered the hockey, the Flyers, I covered the Eagles, where my buddy Joe, Billy Joe coached the Eagles with Dick Vermeil for a while, and uh, and the Phillies baseball. And boy, covering Dr. J, and boy, when they talk about a classy individual, 
I have to start with him. What a great person. What a superhuman being. And, of course, we knew how great a basketball player he was. And uh, covering the Sixers, I mean, it was just so amazing. And, uh, and, and I became good friends with Daryl Dawkins and everything. And I remember because that first started. And Daryl Dawkins, he was just a fun-loving person. And I remember uh, I was interviewing, you know, in the locker room. You know, it's all crowded, right? And 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 Daryl Dawkins had nerve to holler, "Hey, let my brother up here. Let him come on up here and get the interview." And he was just so funny. But yeah, I started with uh, uh, Doctor J and M uh, with the definitely seventy sixers and covering the Eagles uh, uh, with Dick Vermeil and uh, you know Wilma Montgomery, Harold Carmichael, all those guys, Bill Berge. It just was a tremendous thing having that opportunity. And and the funny part. Me being a reporter, I always look for the positive and everything. So, I mean, I mean, I'll, I would speak the truth about something, you know, if someone made a mistake or whatever. But I would always, and, and the players would love that because I'm looking for the best at them. You know, you know what I'm saying? Because in sports, you're going to have some good days, you have some bad ones. So, and then from there to uh, the Bulls, man, that was an awesome run because I got used to being around winners, Okay. I mean, all their championships, six of them, I had the good fortune of covering them, living in Chicago. It was just amazing. It was just an amazing thing. And, uh, and, and man, Dr. I mean, uh, uh, Michael Jordan, man, classy. My boy was Scotty Pittman. I tell you, what a hard work. And, and Craig Hodges, all of them, B.J. Armstrong. These guys are great, man. And, you know, just great human beings. And that's what was so amazing about it. And they do a lot of stuff in the community. Uh, friends like Norm Van Leer, you name it. I, I can't thank the organization because they were really good to me as far as being a, a reporter and especially being independent. You know what I'm saying? So do you, so do you, think, you think if we, if we, if we look, uh, pay enough attention, we'll get a chance to see you in some of the last dance footage? Excuse me, man. Come on, you know. We got to be celebrating, man. I, I, I remember one time uh, when we went down to play uh, uh, on the road, sometimes normally we, we go to the United Center and before that, the old stadium. And I remember Michael George saw me down at the Orlando, man. He said, everybody's here now. <laughs> did, did you ever make any bets with MJ? Make what? Did you ever gamble or make any bets with Michael Jordan? No, I'm I'm not a gambler. That's okay. why I've seen when 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 my guys were playing the cards and everything. I never I never played cards. I mean, I played yeah. Tonk and all those things. Yeah. I, I didn't want to lose my money, man. See, <laughs> I, I'm telling you, I wasn't that good. See, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but uh, no, yeah, you know, Mike Michael was a big big gambler and stuff. But um, yeah, but man, a classy guy, classy guy. Yeah. yeah, indeed. And, and now we want to transition um, to a question that, you know, uh, that everybody in our generation, of course, uh, from your generation, also uh, think about is the state of HBCU football. You know, uh, we, we know in your generation and in the 80s provided a lot of HBCU legends um, for us to learn about. Right. You know, Emerson Boozer, yourself, Jerry Rice, Ed Tutal Jones. Uh, Doug Williams, exactly. Uh, Whoa, Eric man. Williams, um, you know, um, you name them. You know, I mean, came from HBCUs. You know, and and I, and I just learned um, Hugh Douglas, my fraternity brother, uh, when I got to uh, when, find out he went to HBCU as well because I was a fan of him when he played for the Eagles. You know, so uh, but now the state of HBCU football and then being impacted by COVID and one of Keisha's missions. Statements is if you if you're good enough they will find you. So even back then, HBCU players were overlooked, but you all were given opportunities to make the teams. Now we're even more so overlooked, but very given given very little opportunity to unseat some of these draft picks that they just give these long term contracts to. Talk about. Your opinion of just the state of HBCU football, I guess, starting over the years, and what do you think about it now? Let's let's go before Kofi as far as uh, how HBCU football has been, you know, uh, putting guys in the league like Darius Menard, 
you know, Danny Johnson in the last couple of years. There's a nard. Uh, should have, I think he was a first team uh, all defensive player. He should have made the Pro Bowl, should have been there this year as well in his second year. So let's just talk about just the state of HBCU football as far as uh, getting putting guys into the NFL and just overall um, notoriety and, and, and support for HBCU football. Yeah, it, it's, it's really a tougher now, like you said, uh, um, because a lot of people always talk about a D1 school and uh, always, and, you know, of course, they offer the young people the money, the scholarships, and, and that's so important. And, uh, and a lot of uh, we have a, a tough time trying to get scholarships and everything. I mean, you know, you think about a, a, a great education, but they're looking at the play to play the game and they want to go to the next level if they have talent, you know, and being in the right place at the right time. But it, it is so hard for them right now. And then, unfortunately, that discourages some of the young people to go there. You know, a lot of times they might go to a college and then uh, or maybe drop out of another college and then go to a small college like, you know, H. Right. And see, one of my biggest complaints is, Keisha, I already know where I'm going to go with this. She already know who is my favorite HBCU quarterback for the past couple of years. We're going to stay in the CIAA, Amir Hall, out of not Bowie, but Bowie State. I used to always mess that up, but Keisha got me corrected. Bowie State lit up HBCU football his whole career. He didn't okay. really get us. He went to one of those all-star games, but they didn't even really let him throw the ball. You know, then he didn't really yep. get a chance at making the NFL, but you have these quarterbacks from PWIs. While they're talented, they, they are holding roster spots and making millions. Oh, but a quarterback like Amir Hall can't even get a chance to grow into the position in, in the pros. It's just given to these guys coming out of, you know, FBS, mm-hmm. Power 5, Group of 5 schools, who, mm-hmm. if, if you really look at it, uh, the HBCU athlete is going to grind a little harder than them, in my opinion. No, you know it, it, you no. you're right, Derek. It, they do. It's no question. If you, if, you, if you can't tell me that um, um, Amir Hall can't beat out uh, Blaine, uh, Blaine Gabbert, you know what I'm saying? If you if you put them one on head to head. I, I, I'm, I'm going to take Amir Hall hands down. Yeah, I know Blaine Gabbert had that one year of college football, you know, where he – Rose with the draft boards and with the first round draft pick, but he has done absolutely nothing in the NFL. So you have someone like Amir Hall and another good friend of mine, Devontae Kincaid, uh, who ha- who wasn't really given a chance to make it in the NFL. They try to say, oh, because uh, he's short and small. Um, the quarter for the Cardinals is not very big. Matter of fact, Devontae is bigger than him. Now, I know that young man won the Heisman, but still, our great greatest athletes that are putting up all these records in HBCU football are not given the opportunity to, to a fair shot. They're not even given a fair shot to make these NFL teams because of proposed, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, long-term talent or potential of so-called first round draft picks. It shouldn't matter yeah, if you're a first round see. draft pick or, or, or a free agent. If I outperform you, I should make the squad. You cut him and save you some money. Yep. See, and, and unfortunately, we, we have run into that before. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, let me just take you back a little history. At one time, unfortunately, there what we call a quarter system that you only can have a certain amount of, of black players on there. I mean, you know, it wasn't out in the opening, but – there was certain limited, okay, that you could have. But now the the the, the bottom line is, and, and, and I, I really don't like the way the system is. You got to, uh, I'm just using Reggie White as a great, or, 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 or Doug Williams as a great quarterback and proven to be all pro. And then you draft a kid out of college on potential and pay him. That's just like if I'm working a job, and I'm doing well, I should get paid for the job that I'm doing right now, not paid on potential. And that's one of the tough things about the draft and everything. And like you said, and then some people invest millions of dollars in the player. They, they can't put the other player in there, even if the other player is better. Uh, you know, 
it, it just it just goes to show that unfortunately that's the way it is because they want to get their value out of the player once they right. In. But in the name of the game to win, yes, <laughs> yes, you, you yeah. would think so, right? There's no question. You know, I mean, because like. I mean, like, I, I went to Mississippi Valley State, the home of the GOAT, Jerry Rice. And, and what about the quarterback, Trotton? Man, when it's hot, that's my friend. Both of, both of those men are my fraternity brothers. They are my okay. chapter frat. You know? Uh, yep. He could throw and it. And it just really bothers me that I see a, a young man coming out of HBCU that's balling, that has the talent, that has the grind. And he just he, he, he isn't really given the chance to make a squad because of proposed potential. When you're trying to say the HBCU players don't have potential, they do. If you give if you give them a fair shot, uh, some of the HBCU players will beat out the Power Five, Group of Five um, players hands down. You know, yeah, they may be a little faster or whatever, but we'll beat them out. Well, well and, and that's not even the case, but uh, you know, outworking, that's the key five, yeah. But like you said, it's, it's the person that they invested money in. And in, uh, unfortunately, that's the rule of thumb when it comes to that, you know, and they, they pay on potential. So. All right. So uh, next up, we want to talk about your book. Now, I have the book. I got it today in my mailbox and I'm definitely going to read it. I'm, I'm, and I, what I'll do is, you know, uh, you know, I'm going to write a, I'm going to write a, uh, I'm going to write about the book on Black College Experiences page. So. You know, uh, everyone, uh, after this show, you make sure you go and follow us on, on our uh, Twitter page, Black College EXP, Facebook, Black College Experience, and Keisha, the webpage is Black College Experience, Inc., correct? Correct. All right. And so you'll be to check out my review on Earl, on Earl Christie's story. So let's talk about this book. I read it. I mean, I read a few pages of it as I was, um, you know, listening to you talk. I mean, you, this is a, I can, I can already tell you, this is a good, going to be a good book because not only do you tell your story, but you include photographic moments. A lot of people don't put pictures like that in their books. And you're sharing a, a little bit about yourself in the writing and also in the moments that you've experienced. So let's talk about, first off, what made you decide to share your story in the form of a book? I have a philosophy that I want to share it with people. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. And I wanted to build up the attitude of you that if you go through trials and tribulations, and you will, that you let nothing deny you. If you persevere and give it everything, give it your all. And I don't, I don't care whatever field it is, and give it your all and let you know there's no time for excuses. You know what I'm saying? Excuses are not for winners, okay? And, and, and I believe that if you can uh, go through those trials and tribulations and you still can be successful, you still can persevere and be what you want to be. You may have to work hard. It may take me eight hours to do the same thing. It only takes you four. But I'm willing to pay the price. And I want to let you know, you know, that, you know, when things get tough, you know, I remember my grandmother used to say, I used to cut wood, right? I never lift weights. And man, I, one day this wood was so hard and I would be cutting the wood and just chopping it. And the ax was probably dull too. And then I said, Grandma, this wood is tough. This wood is tough. I thought I looked at her. She looked at me sympathetic and said, get tough with it. And that's the key factor. I've been getting tough with it the rest of my life. I mean, that's what it takes, man. You know, that second and third effort. Don't give up, you know, don't quit, don't quit. And, and, and that's making a choice. That's making decisions and everything. But um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm just, uh, it's, it, uh, again, I can't say it's all about your attitude. I woke up this morning. I'm grateful. I got another opportunity. And, you know, you can make a choice to be happy or be a choice to be sad and feel sorry for yourself. You know what I'm saying? But that it, it's all about attitude. I, I'm really, honestly, man, you just got to reach within yourself and try to do your best. 
and we're going to fail. And if you look at it, and you know in basketball or any other sport, most of the all pros fail. They shot 45%, but they're Hall of Famers. They bat 300 and some, you make the Hall of Fame. You fail seven times out of the three. But you continue on. Be consistent. Never give up. Never quit. And that's what, that's what it's all about. So. Yes, indeed. Keisha? Nope, I have nothing else. All right. Well, Mr. Earl, I want to thank you for joining the Black College Experience Super Bowl yes. edition. Akish, I think he's the first Super Bowl champ we've had. Correct? I think so. Well, uh, can I tell him that's, where that's can true. check out the book? Oh, okay, yeah. Go ahead. Go, ahead. go right here. Find you, yeah. Earl tell us Christie, where we can find you. The website, com. EarlChristyStory.com. Christ. With a Y, C H R I S T Y, because we can spell Christy different ways, but that's how. I yeah. Like okay. And I, I'm just so grateful to you guys, man. I, I'm telling you, man, what a job you guys are doing, man. I, I love you guys, and let's continue to spread the joy. That's what it's all oh, about. Yeah. Those, those two greatest commandments got to come in play, and that's what all of us, we're in this together. We're on the yeah. team. He, a team stands for together. Everyone achieves more. Yeah, and, and and one of my favorite sayings is after every show, you know, today you were a guest. Now you're Black College Experience family. So whenever yeah. we start back playing football and you want to call and talk HBCU sports with us, you don't even need an invite. You can just jump on in. And I also, uh, whenever oh, we start back football, we have a HBCU pick them. And I definitely want you to join that. Okay, well, you send me the info, and I'm ready. I'm telling you. Yes, sir. Right. Go ahead and close us out. Thank you, everybody. Mr. Chris, we thank you for a excellent interview. We thank you, everybody, for joining us for another week of Black College Experience, the pop-up. Um, this is about as normal as we're getting right about now. It's a little out of the ordinary for us, but continue to roll with us and uh, check out our Instagram, our Twitter, our Facebook as we will be updating and let everybody know um, where they can find or what will be coming next with Black College Experience. Good night, everybody. Good night. Take care.